Father God, we thank you for your word. Your word which is spirit and life. Father, we ask that by your spirit you would enable me to speak and that you would minister your word to us. And as we come now, so we say, come Holy Spirit, have free reign in us and among us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. The account of the angel coming to Mary to announce that she was going to be the mother of Jesus is one that's very familiar to the majority of us. We probably heard it first in a nativity, nativity play when we were quite small, or maybe in Sunday school. It's familiar, but it's not a fairy tale. It happened, and the events that it describes are vital to each and every one of us. And we can learn a great deal about God from these few verses. So let's take a look. Well, the first and most important thing is that God keeps his promises. The events described here were the beginning of the fulfillment of many Old Testament promises. In fact, the entire Old Testament leads up to this point. <coughs> We've heard three of them in the other three readings you've, you've heard since the start of this service. This is the pivotal point in history. The coming of the Saviour. The Lord, God himself, has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to your daughter Zion, See, your Saviour comes, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Isaiah 62. The baby promised to Mary is the Saviour promised to God's ancient people. But not just for the Jewish people. The proclamation goes to the very ends of the earth. And in the previous verse, Isaiah is called to raise a banner to the nations, to call everyone to come to him. Do you know that even Jesus' place of birth was prophesied? But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, and that's the region in which Bethlehem was located, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, over God's people. One whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Jesus is not just an ordinary child. His origins are from of old. He is God. He is the creator. There is no one older. But it isn't just ancient prophecy that we're seeing fulfilled here. Though the angel was sent to a young virgin, just as Isaiah had said. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. The angel brought God's promises to Mary. Verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary. And I think if an angel came to me, I think I'd be pretty afraid. <laughs> Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. <coughs> you are to call him Jesus, which means God saves. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Well, Mary had plenty to be afraid of. She was a virgin, pledged to be married to Joseph. And back then, you were, you were betrothed. A contract was made between the two families. The bride price was paid, and then a year later, you were married. For a young woman pledged to someone to be found to be pregnant, this was something of a serious matter. Because the Old Testament law required and expected 
that on the, wed on the wedding night she should be a virgin. If she was found to be pregnant beforehand, this broke the Old Testament law. And it not only brought shame on her family, but she could be put to death for it. Mary would really be at a risk of shame, of ridicule, and even death. <coughs> but God was good to his promise to her. Because as the angel said, no word from God will ever fail. God is faithful to all his promises. We can bank on them. And even if things don't look good, God will not fail us. And the reason is because it would be against his very nature. God is God, absolutely faithful, and nothing is impossible for him. Well, secondly, for us to get the benefit of his promises, we have to believe them. As it says in Hebrews 11, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And God does reward our faith. Mary believed God. When the angel told her she was going to have a child, she accepted what she was told. But she did ask, how will this be, since I'm a virgin? She believed that God is God, and that anything is possible for him. So when he sent the angel to tell her this, she had the faith to believe what she was hearing. She only asked, how will this be? Because this was something that de de defied logic. She was to conceive and have a son without the touch of man. God is God. His ways are above ours and they're beyond tracing out. And we will not always understand what God is doing. The fact is that he loves us and he wants us to put our trust in him. Now Mary didn't understand how this would happen, but she trusted God and accepted what he said. And if you can think back two weeks, if you mind, you can go back that far. This is in marked contrast to Zechariah, the husband of Mary's cousin Elizabeth, who we met two weeks ago, at the beginning of Luke 1. Now you would have thought that a priest had been serving God for years, would have believed God when an angel appeared to him inside the temple. And Zechariah was only asked to believe that his post-menopausal wife would conceive with God's help in the normal way. But Zechariah wouldn't believe. He said to the angel, how can I be sure of this? Sometimes there is something about growing older especially when we've walked with God for many years. Sometimes we become a little bit cynical. Our faith perhaps becomes a bit fossilised. And we don't quite trust God as we once did. For faith to be healthy, it needs to be exercised. We need to keep praying. We need to keep asking God to do great things because he can. And as we exercise our faith, as we see God answer, so our faith grows. Our bodies might be wearing out, but our faith becomes subtle and we'll see great things happening. Zechariah wouldn't believe, but Mary believed God's promise and received the benefit of it. She became the mother of the Saviour and an instrument in God's plan of salvation. Somebody that everyone will remember. Thirdly, if we want to receive the best from God, 
We need to be willing to take risks. Faith automatically requires us to put our trust in God, in one whom we cannot see. But the effect of his power and love, we do see all around us. Like the wind shaking the trees in the forest. We can't see the wind, but we see the effects of its action. And we trust that the wind is there. Mary was required to trust God, to place herself at his disposal. She was putting herself at the risk of shame, ridicule, and maybe even execution for lewd behaviour. But Mary realised that God is God, that he's quite capable, in fact he's very capable, on delivering on whatever he's promised. She not only trusted God, but she placed herself at his disposal. She trusted him to take her beyond her own known limitations. And this is what God wants of you and me. He loves us, and if you wonder how much God loves us, he gave Jesus for your salvation. The baby to be born would grow up, and 33 years later, would surrender himself to the horrors of the cross, out of love for you and for me, to save us from sin and death. God loves us, and the measure of his love is beyond calculation. So we can trust him not to hurt us or humiliate us, and we know we can trust ourselves into his almighty loving hands. He wants us to trust him and to be willing to, take, to, to let him take us beyond our limitations. This is like a parent teaching their child to swim. Imagine a child hanging on to the poolside and the parent wants them to let go and trust that he or she will catch them. And God is the perfect parent. He's very able to keep us from falling. We might not feel qualified in human terms, but God wants us to trust ourselves into his hands. God delights to frustrate the eyes of the world. Some of the greatest of God's servants have been those whom the world thought least qualified. People like Dallas Aylward, who was thought no better than to be a parlourmaid just to keep polishing the brass. Yet God used her as a mighty mission, missionary and rescued hundreds of children in wartime China. Corrie Ten Boom, the clockmaker's daughter, who ended up being put in a concentration camp for saving Jewish people from the Nazis and then became a great evangelist and travelled throughout the world. Jackie Pullinger, the young woman who was told by God to get on a boat, and he would tell her to get, to get up, when to get off. She got to Hong Kong, he said, get off. And the work that she's done there, or rather the work that God has done through her there, is amazing. Even Billy Graham, who was thought to be very shy, These would not have been the ones that the world would have chosen. But each one was willing to trust God and place themselves into his hands and at his disposal. Our words should echo those of Mary. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And if we will, we will not be disappointed. We need to put ourselves at God's disposal, to be responsive to his leading and willing to take the form of a servant. After all, Jesus did, and he is God.
And fourthly, in this passage, we see the importance of the virgin birth. It's become fashionable among the more sceptical, academic, liberal Christians to reject the idea that Jesus was born of a virgin. They would say that Mary was a liar and that Jesus was born in the normal way. But that actually defeats the whole point. First of all, God is God and nothing is impossible for him. We pray, we pray for healing sometimes and we see God answer. Nothing is impossible for God. And it was of first importance that Jesus should be born of a virgin. When Mary asked the angel, how will this be? How can I conceive since I'm a virgin? And the, lit the literal Greek says, since I've not had physical knowledge of a man. The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God will come upon you. And the Most High, God himself, will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The child would not be born by human semen combining with a human egg. Rather, the Spirit of God would come upon her. Not to create a new being within her womb, rather the power of the Most High would overshadow her. For God himself was entering Mary's womb. The second person of the Godhead was combining himself with a human egg. The Creator was becoming part of the creation. This is the almighty power of God, greater than human understanding, and rightly so. For he is God, and we should not be able to apprehend the almighty, infinite God with our limited, human, created minds. The one to be born is the Holy One. This is God, verse 35. No human being is of him or herself holy. We're all imperfect. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short in some way. We might be good people, but we're not perfect. But this one to be born would be inherently holy. Because this was God taking on human flesh in Mary's womb. <coughs> Mary herself was an ordinary, imperfect girl. Later on, she would get things wrong. With her other children, she would even think that Jesus was out of his mind. And you can read about that in Mark chapter 3. But she would not only believe God now, but in the future, she put her faith in Jesus. Jesus is called the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the earth. He's God from outside of space and time, who for a human lifespan entered creation to die for our sins. And his death and resurrection is effective for all who believe, from the beginning to the end of the world. And in Mary's womb, the all-holy God took on human flesh. And in him, the natures of God and man were miraculously and amazingly entwined together. So Jesus is a unique being. He is unique, fully God and fully man. He came to make atonement for all human sin. He came to make it possible that all imperfect people may be forgiven if we will come to him. It would not have been enough for a human being to die on the cross 
to bring, it, to bring forgiveness to all who will come. So Jesus, who is both God and man, offered himself in our place. Jesus truly is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. For on that cross at Easter, God offered himself as a sacrifice to pay for, to atone for, to wash our sins away. And in his death, we have life. Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God. And even though he bore our sin, he took it on himself in his perfect soul. Death could not hold him. And we're told that when he'd made purification for our sins, he was resurrected and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, Hebrews 1. And this is the child that was being conceived in Mary's womb. This is the child that Mary bore. This is Jesus, the one who is the saviour of the world. And he invites us all to put our trust in him. Like Mary, to willingly put ourselves at his disposal. We won't be humiliated. We won't be disappointed. And he invites us to come and commit ourselves into his hands. Now, even though Jesus died for all humanity, he won't force us to come. He forces no one. He invites us. And we have to freely choose to come, to call on the name of the Lord. Like Mary, he wants to hear from us the words, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. But it's up to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what we see in the accounts of Jesus' birth. How Mary, that, that, that young girl from, from Nazareth, heard the promise and the call from you through the angel. She not only believed, she placed herself at your disposal. And Father, we thank you because your word to her and your word to us will be fulfilled. Father, we thank you for Jesus. For that God-man. We thank you that he offered himself in the place of each and every one of us. We thank you that he died for our sins. And we place ourselves entirely at your disposal, trusting in him who died and rose again for us. Amen.